Have you ever wondered, can you communicate directly with spirit guides, teachers, or non-physical consciousness, or even our higher selves? What would they tell us? My name is Kevin Moore, and since 2015, I started to practice a form of communication which is termed channeling. I have been interviewing experts on my talk show to find out, does life continue after we die? and can we communicate with those that have crossed over? With each expert I spoke to, they all had different ideas. Is there knowledge from the past which could be shared with the present moment? So I thought, why not just speak to the non-physical world directly through channelers around the world? And that's what I set out to do. They call us channelers, we'll take the viewers on a journey into the phenomena known as channeling. And my main goal with this docu-series is to bring a new understanding and awareness to channeling by looking within ourselves and asking, is it truly possible that we can all use this innate ability? and kicking up their heels and, and the last hurrah before they were all going back to college. Um, a, a dozen friends all rendezvoused at a uh, Wisconsin lake house in Lake Beulah, Wisconsin for one last hurrah. Um, you know, Christopher came and said he was heading up there and, and, and Sally and I, we knew that they were going to be misbehaving but we were kind of comfortable in the fact they were going to be in this bucolic setting. Nobody's going to be driving, you know, no, no nonsense in the cities. They were going to be out there, and they did. They, you know, went to a local pub, kicked up their heels, drank too much, came back. Um, as I said, there was a dozen of them. And at one point, four of the boys, two or three o'clock in the morning, walked outside and saw a open boathouse, canoes in it, jumped in with layered clothing and, uh, and untied Timberland boots that they called Tim's and, and, and a snoot full of uh, alcohol and paddled out and uh, none of them made it back. In the morning, the other kids who were in the house woke up and discovered that these four guys were missing. They looked out and saw on one of the icy part of the lakes an upturned canoe, called the police. I got a call uh, right around noon I was waiting for Christopher to come home to watch the football game together, a Buffalo Bills game, which we were both big fans. And uh, I'd been texting him, hey, where, you get, where are you, buddy? What's going on? And I got a call that they were missing. And to be honest with you, I kind of expected to drive up and find that he had met some gal, local gal, and they were in a boathouse or, or they slept at somebody's house that they met or got in a little trouble and who knows. Um, my wife, on the other hand, actually, in hindsight, knew it, that he wasn't ever going to come back to us in that fashion. So I drove up, and halfway up, I got a phone call that it was no longer a uh, search but a recovery, that all four boys had drowned. And it was very surreal. I think you really, literally, and, and it's a blessing, you go into a bit of a shock. You still can function, you can still control, but everything still very hazy. For me to describe that day is still very hazy and very painful. So I got up there, and my boy was the first body discovered and brought in. And per Wisconsin law, um, you can't identify the body. They took pictures, and it was him, but, I, but his spirit was no longer there. And I, I didn't even know that, but I knew something was, was gone. Um, it was grueling. I went outside and started making phone calls to Sally, who had to tell the kids. I had to call Caroline, who was visiting a boyfriend at the time in St. Louis called my sister, who's now with Chris on the other side, his godmother, his godfather Michael, who was my pal, and a dear friend who, who helped me navigate all of this that, that week. Um, and Wisconsin won't ship the body back until they do a 
coroner's report. So it took a couple days and uh, came home and started making the arrangements, Kevin. And, and from everything from funerals to burial plots to reception to accommodation, whatever, it was, it was I, left foot, right foot, you know. I'll tell you this, I would, every night I would come home, and I've been sober 33 at the time, 30 years, and, and grateful for my sobriety and, and lived a, a, a pretty blessed life. I'd get on my knees and i thank God, because i do that every night. But I'd get on my knees and I'd say, you know what, but I'm PO'd at you for taking my kit. And then I'd go to bed and there's so much activity that I'd just pass out. And, uh, and I did this on the fourth night, I did the same thing and I said, you know, we're not good, you and me. You took my kid. And I laid down and I got a message. And it was the only the second time that I ever felt that I got a message from the divinity, from the spirit. And he said, I didn't take your son. You know, I welcomed him home, but his free will and his recklessness caused him to come home early. And he said, remember, I lost a son too. So it was at that point that I stopped viewing God as this advocary, adversary who took my son and, and, and became an advocate to help me get through these days. And, and years since then, I've relied heavily on that relationship. And I know my <clears throat> son had then crossed to the realm of somebody who is benevolent and loving or something that's benevolent and loving. And it was, uh, it was, it, it was a shift in my, spiritual, in my spiritual pursuit at that point. How do you um, really uh, looked into the, you know, the question of where do we go when we cross over before? Is that something that you'd really sort of spent much time on to explore? No. <laughs> That's a great question. No, no. I, you know what? I was raised Roman Catholic and, and, and believed in the afterlife and believed in God. Never gave a whole lot of thought to it. I just assumed, you know, whatever, harps, clouds. Um, but I believed that there was an afterlife and there was a God. I just, it's kind of like believing in the Secretary of the Treasury. I believe in it. I don't have a whole lot of interaction with him, right? But, but I believe he exists. And it was the same thing. So at this point, this is what caused me to start this search, was that I wasn't willing to accept a world devoid of my boy. I immediately called a medium that I had met 16 years before. And I don't know if it was on a spiritual lark or a search. I had met this woman, Nancy Myers, and she was in the West Suburbs. And most of the, most of the reading she gave me was kind of mundane. It was, but then again, I had no urgency. I didn't need to meet anybody, right? My parents had gone, but they had gone when they were supposed to go. People had gone, family had gone, but it was in, in relatively normal order, right? So I had gone and, and the meeting the, it wasn't very impactful, but she got to the end and she said, your dad's here. And I got to say, I adored my dad. I adored my old man. Iron Joe spent 40 years in the road. He's a, Tough as nails and the most gentle man I know I ever knew and I learned a lot about being a dad from him and loving and And right up there is a uh, is a Canadian Pacific Railroad Lantern because we were railroaders. It was a railroad family and and Nancy said your dad is here And he's holding a caboose and he's saying railroad and That was it. No, no, no answers to the universe. You know, no lottery numbers he just wanted me to know that he was there. And what happened 16 years later, when, when, when my son crossed, I thought, wait a minute, if my dad is there, then this is the place that my son is going, and I need to know more. I need to find out more. And that began this pursuit that I've been on since then and continuing to be on, and probably will until I cross over, Kevin. Obviously, you and your wife, um, you both went to see mediums together. Uh, was that very healing for her to have that confirmation? You know, she, other than this Nancy, I, I made a few phone calls with Nancy Myers after Christopher crossed over, and she gave me specific incidences that happened, including the untied boots and the roughhousing. And very difficult thing to say, the, 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 the lung filling up with water, you know. Um, she told me things that, Nobody knew. The current report wasn't published. She didn't know anything. And so I knew we were on to something. And then not long after that, Sally's dear friend, college friend, set up an appointment for Sally to fly to Denver to see um, 
to see, uh, uh, it'll come to me, but uh, uh, who's a, a, a wonderful medium. And, and, and so she saw her alone and, and she came, and Christopher, this, Christopher's gone a couple months, so it's pretty unusual for a spirit to be able to, to communicate and cross this efficiently. But told her things that nobody knew, including Rebecca Rosen, excuse me, who was just outstanding. And, and Rebecca told her, you know, Christopher is sending you a peanut, peanut butter cups. Well, I didn't know that. Sally would buy bags of the mini cups or the peanut butter cups and mail them to him at college or in, when he was at a prep school and, and, and at the ranch and boarding school and would send him his favorite, you know, candy. I didn't know that. And he would send it back to her. And he had given her a bunch of other signs that only she knew. So she actually went first, you know. It wasn't long after that that I looked up Andrew Anderson on a website about, even though Nancy was amazing, I was talking to her on the phone. And I wanted to look into the eyes of a medium who was looking at my son, clairvoyant, right? And so I looked up this guy, Andrew Anderson, and I, and I made an appointment to go see him. And to be honest with you, I, I, I always keep my options open, right? I knew I could just cancel if, it, if I didn't want to do it. So here's an amazing story. The morning I had, and I'll show you when we go to the grave later, I had moved his grave over from one or the other. When we buried him, it was in the winter, snow covered, you know, the, the, the graveyard. So this, this woman who sold us burial plots put him right next to a couple called the Sheridans, and it looked like he was their kid. And let me tell you, on this side or the other, he's my kid. End of story. So I moved him over one. They charged me half, these bastards, but, but that's neither here nor there. So I moved them over one. So this was in June, and the, the ground was now loose. We couldn't move them until the ground had dried, and we could put the headstone down until the, you know, the Midwest, the, the ground's frozen all the way through. So they moved them over, and the grass, was, uh, the, the you know, dirt was loose all around his grave, of course. So I had bought some shamrocks, seeds, online, and wanted to plant them. So I said, this is an ideal time. You know, I, I went to the dresser and I grabbed a bracelet that's on my car, I'll show you. It's a leather bracelet from Disney World that he gave me when we were four, and it's a dad on it. I think it was goofy, you know. The, and, um, and so I go, to the, I go to the grave with the shamrock seeds and, and plant them around the top and the bottom. For a couple of years they sprouted, and uh, I was very pleased with that. And then I, I said goodbye to him and jumped in the Jeep and drove to Hoffman Estates to see Andrew Anderson, meet him for the first time. When I walked in, we, we sat down and talked, and he saw a couple of pictures of Chris. And he said, you know, your boy's here and he's beautiful. And I'm thinking, well, you got a picture of him. Of course he's beautiful. Then he said, Chris acknowledges that you celebrated his birthday like you always do, which we did. We went to Rana, Japan's, which was an expensive birthday present. We do it once a year for the kids and, had, and, and, and it's honored his birthday on April 15th. He said, Chris acknowledges that you planted shamrocks or planted something at his grave recently. Was that today? I said, yeah, it was today I planted shamrock. And he said, Chris acknowledges you're wearing a bracelet he gave you. This was in the first 15 minutes, Kevin, of sitting down. And you know something, the, the, the sense of wonder has never, has never stopped in, in three plus years. Um, I still meet with Andrew, and, and we're actually pals now. And, and through the book, I mention him a lot. So he gets a lot of <laughs> referral business, which he's very pleased about. But he's exceptional and, and, uh, at raising, you know, uh, making that connection. To me, the mediums are conduits. They're cell towers. They're just better at it than we are. You know, I think we all have this gift that we need to, that if we want to, we, we need to bring to the, the forefront. It, it's like being a major league pitcher, right? You know, everybody's got a right arm and everybody's got an elbow that works for some, but some people can throw 95 mile an hour fastballs or curveballs. What it does is take strength and work and a gift. And that's what I think. I think mediums are like major league pitchers. Obviously, if I said to you, what is channeling? How would you answer that? Here's something funny that what, 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 a year, Significant and then kind of a humorous aspect of it. The first year anniversary, um, I'd gotten up at 3 o'clock in the morning, which had started happening. I'd come in here. I would light some sage and candles and meditate, listen to some meditation music. 
And the first anniversary, I picked up a pen and started writing. I was getting messages from Chris. I wasn't even sure what the heck was going on. And I, and I started, you know, and, and here's my process. I would do that. I would finish. I would turn the lights on. I would get a, a fine point pen. I'd write you know, clarify the words I couldn't figure out, kind of edit it, put it in a file, staple it, date it, move on. Right? That was the process. But this is this miraculous thing. All of a sudden, I'm having this connection with my son and literally dictating conversations with him. Right? One way. He's telling me. And I had called it automatic writing. And I had written about it as automatic writing in the book until maybe... A couple of weeks before I was done with the manuscript, and I was finishing Bob Olson's book, and he described what automatic writing was. And automatic writing is you go into a trance, you write in somebody else's handwriting, and you have no recall of what you wrote. I was like, damn, that's not what I do. What Chris comes to me and gives me these messages is called channel writing or spirit writing, right? You know, so it's completely different from automatic writing. Both communications exist. Mine, so I had to go back, think I was a Word document, and take out every time I referred to this as automatic writing. And, and thanks, Bob Olson, for clarifying that for me before I published the book and looked like an idiot. So he started channeling through to me, and, and, and it's, I'm really aware of what he's saying. And he's telling me, talking about incidents that I've lost sight of or forgot or would never say. I'll give you an example. He made one reference to life being easy, like gliding down water in a canoe. Now, I'm never going to use the analogy of a canoe. I'm never going to set foot in a canoe. My son drowned in a canoe. Canoes are bad mojo to me, right? So I'm not going to come up with that analogy. I'm not going to use that term. He also said at one point to me, I know this scares you, Dad, getting this close to the other side. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. So the bottom line is these people... Their spirits on their side are not omnipresent. We're all parts of God on this side and that. But they're not divine beings with all knowledge of things. You know, um, He was wrong. And that was real validating for me, Kevin. Because if he's wrong, that means it didn't come from me. Right? Another time he said, we get a kick out of you over here. And I'm thinking, that's great. Who's we? Is it you and Pat? Is it you and my brother? Who's we? And he never followed up. That made me understand and, and comprehend that this wasn't me. This wasn't me fooling myself. Otherwise, I'd know who we was. You know, I'd, and, I, and so I knew at this point, then I showed this to mediums, Andrew Anderson, Thomas Sean, who said, oh, absolutely, that's Chris. That's just him. They're flat out. So, I, I, you know, these well-accepted members of the psychic community are telling me that my son is communicating to me. So once I got comfortable with it and stopped doubting, it, it started flowing. And this happens, and it's, it's, you know, so it's been two and a half years since it started. It started the first anniversary. And this happens to this day. You know, twice, three times a month, <clears throat> I'll get woken up with this calling, come in here and start my routine. You know, I might play sports growing up. And when you're on a winning streak, you never change, right? You don't change spikes, you don't change batting gloves, you don't, whatever. So the same thing. I use the same legal pad, the same brand of thick velocity pen. I have a chart where I line up my chakras. I do it all the same. The only thing that changes is the <clears throat> meditation music is different. I do sometimes music, sometimes guided meditation. It's kind of whatever spirit takes me to. And, and I go through it. And he's criticized me in the book and said, it was stupid music. Sounded like a like a phone ringing, you know. So that that cracks me up, right? What do you think um, some of the main reasons for him coming through are? I mean, obviously, it's it's your healing. It's obviously this book has helped so many other people as well. What are some of the the reasons for him coming through, and what some of his messages that are that are have been so helpful to you and right. others? Right, and that's a great question because <clears throat> I think my healing was a byproduct of the book and the intention of the book was to help other people and he knew that I'd be a good ambassador. I don't look some, like somebody who would be lost in the metaphysical world. <clears throat> I don't. So when I, you know, I've had friends say to me, boots on the ground type guys, 
say, if anybody else told me this, I wouldn't believe it, but because it came from you, I completely believe it. And that's, I think, why I'm kind of a good messenger for this stuff. So he wanted me, I think because of our intense love for each other, he wanted me to see what his world is like. He needed me to know that he was good. I mean, really friggin' good. And that where he at is good, and we're all going. You know, you may as well pack your kitty bag now, because <clears throat> nobody's ducking out of this trip. But the main thing for the book is to help others, specifically parents who lost kids. I mean, a lot of them go through life, the rest of their lives sleepwalking, assuming that they're gone. Now, they're gone in the sense of the pictures of my boy, you know, smiling, you know, happy with his arm around me. That's not the same. But the energy, the, 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 the spirit is. Yeah, I love you, Dad. I feel the hug, right, like that, right? And I love you, Dad. And here's how we say it. I love you, Dad. You know, he had this deeper voice. And it was just adorable. So he needed me to communicate that. And for me to communicate that, I had to get more knowledge. I had to investigate. I had to research. I had to read. I had to go. I had to go to the Vortex. I'm going to Lilydale. I'm doing all these things because I would do anything to be with him. And I'm continuing that path of doing anything. And the result is I have information to help others. And like sobriety, I believe that if you don't share it, you could lose that gift. You've got to give it away to keep it. So I've been blessed with this gift to connect with him and subsequently a couple of other people in the family that he brings through. But if I don't share this with others and provide service and comfort and love, I could very easily lose this gift. And I'm not going to lose this gift. But you never thought that you were ever going to become an author and um, you know, be working on your second book now, for example, with your son's information. God, no, Kevin, i got to tell you. Here, here are the notes from the second book, right? The, the meetings, the notes, the experiences, right? And when I wrote this first book, my intention was that I wanted a record of my experience with mediums, my experience with channeling with him, so that someday in the not too distant future, I could be sitting on my rocking chair on a porch somewhere, smoking a cigar and reading this, 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 this dialogue, this record that I've got for me. That's all I wanted it for. I had no idea I was supposed to write a book. It was only the following February when I was given a message that you need to write a book. And it was from him. My, my wife was downstairs talking to her brother Ricky about when he was three, how he'd play hide and seek two and three and how tenacious he was. And he'd say hide again and he'd go hide and he'd come back and you'd find him and he'd go, and you'd barely find him and it's like, boom, hide again and he'd go in the closet. And I'm listening to this smiling, literally sitting on the stairs listening. And uh, I turned around and sat down and thought, he's hiding, you know. The same way I looked behind the couch or looked in the closet, I now need to look behind the, 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 the veil. And I sat down, grabbed my record and start, you know, my, my, my records of, of, of sessions and started writing the book. So I'd never had intention of being an author once, much less twice. So shall we actually read some of the, um, the passages that, he, that he's brought through, you, that you've channeled through? Okay. So the first one was on the anniversary of his crossing. It was 3 a.m. And he said, it's like a beach. It's beautiful. It's pink, warm, but the colors are soft and vibrant. Pink, blue, and strong green. The air is warm surrounding us. It's air and love. It's like love air everywhere. Nothing hurts. Warm and happy. Always young. Miss you, Dad, but I'll see you soon enough. Be nice to Mom. Try to understand she feels alone. You don't. You know I'm here, and you feel me. She's not so sure. This will change significantly in the upcoming year. No recall of bad memories about drowning. It's all warm and good, just love. Remember the beach, the colors, the soft warm breeze, but it's not a breeze. Don't be afraid of anything, not health, money, the kids, mom, I'm here, I'm on it. I'm sorry you're hurt so bad, but no other way to get out gracefully. You get it, you know, you've been there. I love my friends. I told you they were great loving people. 
They sure came through, hop hop, so did you. You know? That's absolutely beautiful. And I know there's just so many other ones as well that you've channeled. Please, you know. Well, here's the second part of the same first channeling. He said it's, and, and this is an indication of how this wasn't from me. It's natural writing, not printing. I wasn't good at cursive, remember? Play place. Fine motor skills, no problem now. Stay with me, Pop. I'm still here. I was cold, but I wasn't lonely. I was with my friends. We have good friends, Pop. I still do, and you do here. I noticed the time. It was 3.49. Chris wrapped it up. I had already fully crossed, Pop. Now go to bed. I love you. Talk soon. What he was referring to in the fine motor skills was when he was little, we took him to this therapy place that was supposed to work on his fine motor skills. And I went with him, and, and he used to make reference to it as the play place. I forgot completely about it. I mean, it wasn't on my radar. And he brought it up. But he was telling me that, you know, he could throw a ball and he could paddle. He could do all kinds of things. But writing was tough for him. Cursive was tough. So he'd print. And he was always embarrassed by it because his fine motor skills were not great. Although he was a phenomenal athlete. And he made reference to that, that, that that's not a problem now. That he's healed of that. And later on he talks about being healed of, of addiction, of a stutter, of insecurity. You know, he talks about that he's evolved past that. You know, he's, he's told me about that, 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 you know, that he, when he first started coming through, he was very, very almost guilt-ridden about putting us through so much pain. And that was pretty constant for a number of different meetings with mediums. And then he finally processed through it. And, and he, had, he had made peace with that and moved on. And he wasn't plagued by that, what he put us through. You know, and that's, that's amazing stuff. It's stuff you don't bring up and think about. You know, that's stuff that's presented to you. And so we were grateful. We, we hated the fact that our grief caused him in this, in this place of joy to still feel bad. The last thing we ever wanted our little boy was to feel bad. What's he describe about the place that he's in right now? I mean, I mean, we only have human words to describe, you know, where Christopher is right now. But how does he describe it through you? He's made reference to a wall of love when he first crossed, and he said, "You can't comprehend it. You don't understand it, but you will when you cross." Um, made reference to it being the air is love, and it's love air. Somehow the colors blue and green pop out. He's made reference to it being like a beach where it's always warm but there's a breeze and you're always comfortable and you're always happy. So, you know, those are, that's his reality of happiness now. That's how he's described the other side to me. You know, and he said to me, you know, Dad, you're in boot camp. Our side is boot camp. This side is like a beach house in Maui. You know, because that was his joyful place, right? That we never been to Maui, but we've been plenty of beaches and he loved the tropics. He loved that feeling. So that's where he gets to, that's how he gets to enjoy his other side. He's made reference to um, doing what we would consider classes and evolving and grades and being promoted, you know, to a higher level. And I had concern because my limited, you know, slug like brain, right? Psychic slug brain was like, wow, if he gets promoted, if he goes to another level, will that limit our access or ability, you know, if he's farther away? And he knew that and said, look, Pop, it's like calling long distance, whether it's from Arizona or farther out in California, the connection's the same. It's just far, you know, different level. It won't change our connection. And that was really reassuring to me. It made me feel better. So he's growing to go to other levels. Yes. Yeah. And, um, Told he has a job. He has a job and that his job is helping young, he was always Pied Piper for kids, kids loved him. You know, he was just cool and good looking and sweet. And, 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 and so his job is helping other kids who cross. You know, they're confused, they're lost, they're lonely. And that, that he helps them with transformation. Not a bad job, right? No, not at all. Not at all. Wow, that's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. Yeah. Um, what's the most important um, point that maybe Chris has ever touched on for yourself and maybe for the book as well that he's done? That, 
they, and, 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 and I guess it's easy for me to do more, more young people, but I think it's for everybody, they're still here. You know, that he had mentioned that it was like walking from one room to another. We don't see them. It doesn't mean they don't exist. If you're behind a screen and you've walked from one room behind the screen, you still exist. Even though you can, and that's what, that's the message that he needs me to carry is that they're still here. They're right here. And, and that they want to communicate with their loved ones here. And it doesn't take away from their job or their life. They're not stuck. They're not stuck souls. You know, they're, think about it as getting cell phone calls and texts from your, my daughter's in India. I can't wait to get texts and video and stuff from, well, it's the same thing. He's just on the other side, but they're still here. So it's not the same, it'll never be the same. It's a bad trade, but it's the only game in town that their spirit is still around. I can feel, I feel him right now on my neck. He's here. I know when he's around me. Sometimes it takes me unawares and it's like, oh buddy, you're here. Sometimes he'll send me a sign, but I know he's here right now. And there's other times, I'm gonna be honest with you, when the Cubs won the World Series, I wasn't a big Cub fan, but we were watching the game. And the Cubs won the World Series and he wasn't around me. He was around his friends. And they were all celebrating the World Series and he was there with them. That's how this stuff works, right? Um, a medium we had talked about after the first golf outing, I said to the medium, where was he during the golf outing? He said, it was all around you, but he was mostly with his friends. Right? All his friends had come and been part of that. That's so consistent, Kevin. That's who he was. For your family and for all the people that are surrounded uh, as friends with the memory of Chris, um, how much has your work with Chris doing this helped these people around Chris? Immeasurably. Not just this, but the golf outing. I mean, as crazy as it sounds, it was funny. Before the book, I had, you know, he crossed in January with the first golf outing in September. And it gave me a chance to work on something good where I would feel him around me. And I got used to feeling him around me. And when the golf outing ended, I went into a little bit of a funk, a little depression, because I was used to getting up at 5, 3 in the morning, coming in and working on it, and feeling him around me. And pretty soon it was, all the good was done, but it was over. And it was heartbreaking to me. that this. And I had that fear, by the way, about finishing the book. The fear was I feel him with me all the time when I'm involved in this. You know, talking to you, going out to California for a book signing, I feel him with me all the time. And my fear was when I finished writing the book that that chapter of our lives combined would end, and it doesn't. You know, um, the friends and family, all this stuff, they just love being part of it. All of his friends, his college friends, just amazing young kids who are all still part of our lives. So the fact that this gives them something to hold on to. They all came to the book signing. They all come to the golf outing. They all come to the reception at the grave on the anniversary. You know, so the fact that we can keep this ball rolling and it's not only just honors his memory, but honors his reality because he's still right here. What has it taught yourself on a personal journey about how important it is to actually take a look at where we're going to when we cross over? Because most of us walk through a daze and don't want to own up to that fact that we're, we have that one thing in common that we're all going we're to go, right? We're all going to the yeah. same place, yeah. right? Um, when we don't explore that and we say, oh, it's just you know, a load of rubbish, there's nothing after this existence, and I don't need to look at that, and there's no point in looking at that or exploring that, what would you say about that? You know what? I, I'm not selling anybody anything, right? So if you don't think there's anything next, I'm sorry for you, but that's your deal, right? I'm, I'm not here to try to convince you. I'm not going to try to recruit you. Right? God bless. Move on. Right? But the bottom line is, this is a knowing. This, I don't believe this. It's a knowing. I know that we're going somewhere. And I know it's pretty friggin' cool. And I know when I cross, he'll be there to greet me and I'll get to spend the next lap with him. Right? I'm, on, I'm rounding third, man. I'm 62 years old. I got a lot of work to do here. But, it's, but my time is coming to an end. And I've got no fear. No concerns. You know, I know that my life here is lovely, full of love, surrounded by people I love. 
and the same when I cross, you know, in a more perfect setting. So, you know, the, the, the answer is, you know, if you're going on vacation to the Jersey Shore, everybody Googles, where do you eat, where do you stay, where do you do this? But nobody's, not enough people are concerned about where are we going next, you know? So I know, and what that allows me to do is just relax. You know, I don't have a ton of fear. I'm not afraid to die, you know? That's just a transition. And obviously, um, this book has helped a lot of people who have lost family members, sons, daughters, in different ways, you know, um, maybe even more tragic ways in a sense. Right. I, I mean, there's nothing more tragic than just loss in its own right, but I mean, you know, um, there are other ways of crossing as well, isn't there? You know what, and, and I've, uh, and I seem to me be put in contact, people put me in contact with people who've lost kids, and I welcome that. I was talking to a guy, John, yesterday, son OD'd. You know, he called him the day before and said, you don't sound good, you okay? And the kid said, yeah, I'm fine. And then, then OD'd. Another guy, son went outside and hung himself, right? And so it's very difficult because the guilt that I feel over stupid things, and, and, you know, about missteps that I've made or come up short, is compounded when it comes to that. And, and I was raised in a family, we lost a brother to suicide. And, and it's painful as hell. And when he talked about, if you heard me say that, not getting out gracefully, you know, there was no other way to get out gracefully. So my concern was maybe the depression would lead to something down the line, and maybe this is why he took this exit ramp, his exit you know, point. Um, but the bottom line is, what I needed this guy to understand yesterday on the phone was the addiction that your son had that caused him to die, the depression that caused this other guy's son to take his life, are gone. They're, re they're, they're relieved of those addictions. They're, they're relieved of that pressure, that guilt, that shame, that whatever that causes people to do that sort of thing is gone when they cross over. It takes a little while. You've got to go through the car wash. You know what I mean? But you're clean of it, and you're happy, joyous, and free, sometimes for the first time ever. You know? So you know, don't get stuck in the suffering that they were in, because they're not now. I know my boy is good. I'm, I'm the one feeling bad. I'm the one who cries on you know, a daily basis. I'm the one who sometimes just you know, uh, don't, doesn't know how I'm going to make my next step. right? And then it all works. But he's doing fine. And, and, and he's going to be there when I make the next, when I cross over. And I think the, the whole understanding of like where we do go to and what that reality is, I think it's so much grander than we can possibly imagine, yeah. right? Um, that, that, you know, again, in the book that you've done are just the, the human words for an understanding that we don't really have. And he tells it, he says it to me all the time. You know, <clears throat> he'll say to me, you, you, you can't get your arms around this. You can't grasp this until you cross over. Because it's too big. It's too grand. It's too wonderful. It's too whatever, you know. <clears throat> so I just accept it. You know, it's kind of like you and I were talking about space-time continuum. I, I try to get my arms around that. I'm still completely oblivious to it. So I just accept it and move on, right? And let somebody else figure it out. Let somebody else describe it to you. Because I can't. Right? And it's the same thing. All I know is the other side is really good. <laughs> you know, if we want to simplify it, it's at least common denominator, really good. You know, so going is going to be this magnificent transition to a place of wonder. And no matter what you've done in this life, right. there is no judgment. Right. That's not to say be hurtful, cruel, and, 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 and um, harmful to other people and yourself. Just the opposite, actually. You know, there is a life review, really consistent, what everybody says. There's a life review where you actually live in a brief period of time with people around you, spirits on the side, recall the good and the bad you've done on this side. And the bad that you've done causes you pain to feel what you've caused other people to feel. And it's, and it's you know, it's not, it's not hell, it's not purgatory, it's a life review. So that you don't want to do that again. You know, in my case, I want to live my life that makes my son proud. 
I want to live my life that allows me to know that I'm going to transition, you know, go through the go through the life review and then go hang out with Chris, you know, and that's that propels me to live a better life, to be a better guy. It certainly doesn't say go crazy, do whatever you want. And not all mediums that you've seen as well, not all of them have been able to connect with Chris. There's, there is um, an, a sort of energy exchange between yeah. y your loved one that you want to connect with and, and, and the right you know, um, receiver, right? <laughs> right? Like, a, like the medium or the psychic. So uh, it's not always straightforward, is it? It's rare. I've never not had it happen one-on-one. -on -one. Some of it's just been spot on, psychotic, crazy. Thomas, John, you know, describing my niece who greeted him, names. Thomas John describing five members of the family by name on the other side. There's no record of that. That's not Google. We're not famous people, right? Uh, Andrew Anderson nailing stuff. Uh, Sherry Jewell, this gal, local gal, you know, talking about a fishing, you know, trip and this joyous day, you know, that I wrote about. Um, and there's some mediums that kind of hit and miss. But you know what? There's great chefs. There's great guitar players, you know, and there's people who are guitar players who are getting better, right, the, you know, they're not maestros yet. So, you know, I don't, I haven't encountered anybody in this for the wrong reason yet. But once again, my journey is only a couple of years, right? So I'm kind of new at this, which just kind of makes the book, it's kind of a how-to for dummies, right? <laughs> You're new at this, here's, the, here, here's my experience, strength and hope. So I've never met anybody in there for the greed, the money, the popularity. You know, they're in there for the service and it just happens to be what they do. And some are exceptional and some are pretty good. And some it's like, you know, maybe you should find something else to do. <laughs> you know? But I, I, I truly feel it's like anything else, they have to work on it. But there has to be a connection between the spirit and the conduit. If, if I don't, th if Christopher doesn't, want to be around you, despite the fact that you're connecting with this old man, it might not be a, a good visit. If Christopher feels this confidence and, 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 and happiness to connect with you, it's going to be ridiculous. So I think it's like coaches, teachers, you know, it's got to connect. The, the chemistry's got to work or it just doesn't pay off. And for those watching this as well, we all have the ability, if we've lost someone, to connect to them. So, you know, your example to others watching this is that, you know, if we wanted to channel our loved one through the way that you've done it, um, that is possible. But, you know, as you've said, you know, there are, and I'll personify your words, there are, there are artists, there's people that can draw, and there's the, you know, Picassos and, and everyone else. Um, but we all still have the ability to draw. We all still have the ability to channel in some form. And, and is it a case sometimes if we just listen to that inner voice and just go with the energy that, that maybe is coming through that sometimes that message, message that comes through actually is from your loved one? You know, I, and, and I think that it's exactly right. And I think the thing is we need to, we need to work on getting better at opening up and learning what that means. For me, it's the sage, the candles, the to meditation. Protect to protect one thing and to open up the line, the communication. You know, if, if the phone's off, you're not going to get a call. My phone's on mute right now. I'm not going to get a call. So if I want that to be open, I'm going to give you an example. I was visiting my sister last year before she crossed over, last summer, and I was on a beach in Naples. We connect in beaches. I was on a beach in Naples having a cigar on the ground, and I got a message that says, go to Sarasota. Bro, this is 11 o'clock at night, and that's two hours each way, right? So I checked, made sure I had a handful of cigars, made sure that I had some Red Bull. I went online because I said to Chris, look, if you want me to go to Naples, I'll go. I mean, to go to Sarasota. But if it's closed and I get there, I'm not going to be happy. So I went online and looked and said, you know, Siesta Key, which is where I was going, open 24 hours. I was like, all right, I'm on my way. Drove two hours, listened to music, connected with a medium friend of mine, Sherry Jewell. Connected with my buddy Brad about a, we were doing a book signing and some music I wanted him to do before. And so it was all about Chris. I, I get to the beach, you know, it's now one o'clock in the morning. 
beautiful stars. I've never seen such beautiful stars. I've been in Alaska. I've been all over. It's amazing. I lay down on the beach. I feel them all over me. I get a text from this medium, Sherry Jewel, that says, you know, Chris is all around you right now. Look at the stars. And that's exactly what I was already doing, right? So I, I feel them around me. I'm loving this. And there's a second beach in Sarasota where I've connected with. It's called Lido Key. So I get back to the car and I figure, God, I'm exhausted, but maybe I'm just going to lead a key. And I get a message from Chris that says, next time, Pop. You know, it's cutting me loose so I could go back to, to Naples. But the bottom line is I, I drove four hours, little sleep, because it was worth it to connect. So you've you really got to want it. This isn't a passing fancy. I, would I drive four hours to spend an hour with my kid? Yeah. So, of course, I'm going to do it in the afterlife. And, and I connected with him, and I laughed because I said to somebody, I can see him now poking a friend on the other side saying, see, I told you the old man would show up. You know, and I just, I knew that he was proud that I put in the effort. If I was to say to you then, um, what is the most important message of your work so far? That they're still right here. You know, we don't necessarily get to see them unless we're seeing them through somebody else's eyes, or maybe our own eventually. But they're here. Their spirit is with us, and they want to connect with us. And that you've just got to make the effort, hone your skills. They're not gone. Don't go into that rabbit hole that they're gone, that you won't see them again. Not only will you see them again, you're seeing them now. You can communicate with them now. They haven't left, and they want to connect with you. They're part of your family. They're still include them in, include them in the celebrations. Look for the signs. The signs are incredible. People will say to me, gee, I thought it was silly because I saw this. And, and I said, dude, just be open. And the amount of overwhelming evidence you get is going to make it undeniable that not only are, is there an afterlight and they're part of it, but they're part of your life. We're in a, a little a western suburb just west of the North Shore called Northbrook. And it's right off Dundee Road on Lee Street. It's called Sacred Heart Cemetery. You know, when, when Chris drowned, I had all these details to, to kick out, and his godfather, Michael, and I stopped in and saw great Grace Martinson, who is this great funeral director at Donlan Family Funeral Home, and she, funeral home, and she arranged for us to meet a woman and, and buy some plots here. And, uh, and it was just plain perfect. You know, the, the, I, the funny thing is, he was actually originally interned right there. He was buried between that gravestone and this one. And I wasn't pleased. It, when we picked it out, the snow had covered and the woman didn't tell us that we were next to somebody else. And when the snow melted that first spring, I, end of some winter, I got really angry, called and pleaded my case and ended up <laughs> paying half again as much to move over him one and move over one. And, and he'll be, I'll be occupying the space on this side and his mom will be here. And this is very much how like that that week in, in, in Scottsdale after he fall, fell down the mine shaft, I was just in, in, the, in, the, in the hospital room next to him just like this. And it was just him and I being while he healed. So it's a little different. This is him and I he, being while I heal. You know, so I'm, I'm grateful for the reciprocity. Kevin, I come here all the time. And you gotta understand, this isn't like some old man sitting on a park bench feeding pigeons. You know, for me, this is a place where I can feel his energy. We can connect. Um, I don't think he's living under the ground. I know he's not. But we come here to communicate, and it's a good place. So when I'm stressed, when I'm heartbroken, or we just want to need to spend some time and connect with my oldest boy, I come here. So it's, it's a great place. You know, I, I saw a medium, a one-on-one -on -one with this fabulous medium, um, Thomas John, and he said to me, do you go to his grave all the time? And I said, yeah. He said, like, were you there recently? I said, yeah, yesterday. And he said, good. That's a good place for you guys to communicate. He said, I tell most people who go to parents who go to kids' graves, don't go there. Your kids aren't there. But I'm going to tell you, go there because the, the energy is perfect for you guys to communicate. So, you know, I know that we're here, that he's going to take time out from whatever he's doing on the other side and hang out with his old man a little bit. And we talk and I ask him questions and I throw issues of the day out with family and and we just feel each other but you know that's kind of the relationship we had 
I'd visit him in Tucson and we could just be. You know, we didn't have to talk. It's funny, Kevin, a couple times I've actually started to cut short a visit and would fold up my chair and I'd get a message that said, where are you going, Pop? <laughs> I was like, well, I guess I'm going to sit down and, and talk a little more. And, uh, and I always leave with the same greeting. I tell him I love him and I tell him to be good. I tell him goodbye. And, um, and then I'll, I'll be back here soon. But, you know, he gets in the car and goes with me. You know, but this is just a great energy for us and it's a very healing place for me. You know, it's funny, some people, interviewers like yourself, will be very considerate and say, you know, I don't want to bring up um, these incidents, but the truth of the matter is, the incidents are with me every day. So you're not bringing up anything I don't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and think about all the time. So there is no fresh hurt, no new hurt. You know, there's a broken heart that's always going to be that way. But I have the ability now to process all of this and 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 be with him in spirit. So, yeah, there's, there's no new pain that comes from describing the events of, of January 3rd, 2016. Yeah, it's just the way it is. You know, first of all, Kevin, there's no wrong way to grieve, right? You're gonna have, to this day, it happened with me earlier when you and I were talking, I, I, I get a little emotional tsunami that takes me over of grief and I let it flow through me and I get on with the rest of my day. Um, and people judging you or telling you you should be over it or telling you time heals all wounds, you know, nobody ever said that who lost a kid. You know, you're, you're, you're going to go through life with a broken heart. You can function, you'll be a wonderful person, you'll be loving, there'll be joy, but you'll always have that broken heart. And so almost make peace with that, make peace with that, that pain, that grief. And the other thing is that the door is not shut. That, that spirit, that being, that person who left his body is still somewhere just across the next room, right? Just across the veil. And they're there for you if you open up. So seek them out. Try to find them. Do what you got to do. Go to mediums. Practice yoga. You know, I have a routine that I do to help me open up so I can communicate better with him. I'm going to do whatever it takes, you know. I'm, on this side, I would do anything I could to be with him, and it hasn't changed when he crossed over. You know, so they got to understand that they're not gone. It's different. It's not as good. It'll never be as good. There's no big hugs and kisses on the forehead and, and going to a ball game, but there is still connection, communication, and love. You know, love doesn't die. Energy doesn't die. You know, you got to believe it. It's scientific, Kevin. What I'm telling you isn't fantasy. You know, Rumi said that goodbyes are for those who love with their eyes, for those who love with their heart and soul. There's no such thing as separation. And, and, and that's what he means, is that you may not be able to see them, but that spirit, that being is still there, and there is no separation. Chris and I are, are close just like we were on, the, on this side. It's nowhere near as good. Don't get me wrong. It's a bad trade, but it's all we got. Why is it important to, you know, explore the one thing that we all have in common, which is that we're all going to uh, leave this planet. We all go, come in with nothing. We leave with nothing. Why is it important to explore that side of reality, do you think? You know, my old man used to say that uh, you come into this world all naked and bare. You go through this world without a care. You know, but if you're a good fellow heel, you'll be a thoroughbred there. That's what Iron Joe used to say. So I'm a different guy than before Christopher crossed over. And I know now that I still have to do the day-to-day -day stuff. I still have to work. I'm dropping you off at the train station, going downtown to work on some deals, put some stuff together. I still have to take care of my family. I still have to do all the things I've always done. I have to feed the dogs. You know, I mean, I do all those things. But, but now I have an awareness of another side. And the benefit of that is I know where I'm going. I'm 62, Kev. I'm, I'm rounding third, right? I'm going to be that place. And I want to know what it is. You know, I also want to know that I'm going to spend it with people that I love, like Christopher, which I know. It's, 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 it's not a belief. It's a knowing. And I also know that I'm making them proud. So when I'm doing service, like this film is, this, this documentary is service because it's going to reach people. 
I know that I'm pleasing him and probably pleasing God too, so it's not a bad deal. How have your friends taken it now that they, obviously they've seen the release of the first book, there's a second book you're working on, they know that, that you're using something called channeling, it's just a word to describe how you, you're letting that bigger part of yourself through and you're letting Chris through as well. Um, how have people received that, in, that, that are close to you? Now, if they weren't the type of people that could receive it, they wouldn't have been close to me in the first place. So most of my friends are all guys, guys. I got buddies that play in the NFL, guys that run huge multinational funds, but it, it, you know, guys, guys, but they all have a spiritual bent, you know? And so they've embraced this. They're all part of the golf outing. They're all proud of uh, the celebrations. So, you know, and, and I think in, in like a case of my Christopher's godfather, my pal Michael, Christopher's godfather, his sister passed away a couple weeks ago. She crossed over. And so what I've prepped him for through this, 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 this march that I've been on since January 3rd, 2016, has allowed him to be prepared to embrace his sister Judy, who he knows now is on the other side. He sent me a picture of his sister Judy holding Christopher as a baby, probably at Christopher's christening, and said, you know, they're probably together again. Not probably, they're together again. And I thought, isn't that wonderful? He would have had none of that knowledge if it wasn't for this journey that I've been on, that we've been on. Sounds a bit arrogant. I'm not on this journey. I'm just following the breadcrumbs, Kev. This is being laid out for me. So obviously, mediums for you have played a great service uh, in not only bringing out your gifts, but obviously directly having communication with, with, uh, with your beautiful son. But um, for some people out there who may not be you know, too sure whether to go down that road, um, what would you say to them? Check it out, figure it out. If it doesn't work, we'll refund your misery. You know, we'll refund your loneliness. You know, we pulled up to my house yesterday, Kevin, and what was in front of the door? Three boxes, right? They were dropped off by UPS or FedEx or one of those places. Now, I probably could have gone to the warehouse and picked up all those boxes, right? but it was easier and more professional for somebody to drop those off. So that's a medium to me. Medium's UPS. You know, they're doing their job better than I can do, and they can bring my son closer to me and my dad and my sister, Marsha, closer to me than I could do without them. So I use them. Experiment. And you gotta find a medium that connects with you. The Andrew Andersons, the, 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 the you know, the, the, you know, there's a, a number of, of these wonderful mediums, Sherry Jewell, that I connect with now as friends, right? But they started as just mediums, but they connect with Chris. So therefore, they're still in my life. There's been one or two that just never connected well. So you just move on, right? If the shirt doesn't look good on you, don't buy it. You know, but you got to figure it out. Trial and error. It's worth the effort. You got to take a shot or you're going to live in this... Uh, you know, lonely abyss the rest of your life and that's just not I'm not willing to do that and let's face it Chris has never ever wanted anyone in your family to suffer for um, not wanting to go on with their lives the, the one of the main messages in the book was for you guys as a family to continue and get on with your lives right and to heal and he's part of it Right, he's come to my kids, he's come to my wife. He's part of all of our lives. You know, I, I told you earlier that when we originally were contacting Chris for the first six months a year, he was still suffering with the guilt of putting us through so much pain. And he just kept referring to it as a stupid accident. It was a stupid accident. After that, he had made peace with that. He had made amends and moved on that he, he was no longer dwelling on the guilt of causing us pain. He had moved to another level and he was advanced and past that. And, and that's where we found not just grief, but a happiness through the grief. You know, the grief is going to be part of your life. If you're waiting for it to go away, it ain't going to happen. But you can have a loving, fruitful life around the grief, incorporate the grief, embrace it. But you can't let it interfere with your life and your responsibilities. That's not what Chris wants. That's not what your loved ones wants. That's not what God wants. You know, and, and as you said before, it's unavoidable. We're all going. We're all crossing over at some point. So the, most, the more you can find out about that, I think the better it is. He's told me in readings 
Kevin, that I'm going to have a much easier time crossing over, that he was kind of shocked about it, and that my learning curve will be a lot less because of the sessions that he and I have and the knowledge that he's giving me. So what a gift. You know, my sister, my wonderful sister, who was his godmother, before she crossed over, said to me, Joey, she called me Joey, I'm 60 years old, she still calls me Joey, Joey, she said, you gave me the greatest gift because after reading your book, I'm no longer afraid to die. You know, I mean, it doesn't get a whole lot more rewarding than that, Kevin. And all the other people that you've helped as well, I mean, you know, don't forget them. I mean, I know it's, of course, it's about close family, but you have helped so many other people that you will never know. You know what I didn't know, Kevin? That they're all family. You know, not just the people who lost kids, but everybody. Everybody who's felt the loss or not. We're all family. This is one, you know, Bob Olson described it as souls and spirit as part of a great, I drove you down to Lake Michigan to show you how big it was. So every wave is part of a soul that's part of one big body. Every wave is a soul, and we're all part of this body that encompasses an example of Lake Michigan. You know, so we're all part of that. So when I'm helping somebody else, I'm helping me. I'm helping Chris. I'm helping them. And that's kind of the deal for me now. It's kind of the mission. I've been given this great gift to be able to connect with my son and now starting to connect with my sister and through him. But if I don't give it away, I don't know if I keep getting that rush of love information if I start hoarding it for myself. So I, I talk about every interview. <clears throat> I give out my email, connect. I send books out all the time to people. This isn't about me making a buck, a buck on the books. It's about you healing and understanding how thin that veil is now. Your loved one is right on the other side of that wall. Thank you. You're welcome. Have you ever considered that your soul and the family members around you as a soul group so needed in this lifetime to look at beyond the veil and that had your son not given his life, in a sense, you as a soul group would never look beyond the veil. Do you think there was much more than just um, an accident here? Well, you know, I don't believe in predestination. So I think Christopher's free will caused him to cross early. Yet Christopher's the kind of kid that wasn't gonna let that be wasted or hoarded or selfishly kept inside. So it expanded and there's you know, I get amazing feedback from people in my family. And there's a couple, I think, that probably think I went off the reservation. And that's fine, too, right? I'm not going to judge your concept of what life or afterlife is, right? That's, that's not up to me. But if I can bring some peace and some solace to somebody who lost somebody, you know, that's part of the deal. That's the best part of the deal. Obviously, being here and maybe feeling the presence of Chris here, it's that's a very different kind of connection than when you channel Chris. Um, so w what's that like when you, when you channel Chris compared to any other form of... of it's healing? an intensity. It's a one-on-one -on -one intensity. This is light. This is, I feel his presence. I talk, I communicate, I think. He loves having the dog here. When, when, I, when I'm doing spirit writing with him, it's, it's, it's an intensity. It's almost foggy. And, and mystic and the messages are coming directly from him from the other side and I'm so impressed with his ability to do that and he's been doing that since a year in and, and actually communicating with with medium since months after he crossed so that tell me that tells me and they tell me that he's an old soul that, that he's progressed this isn't his first rodeo you know so that intensity which I value is also draining. When I'm done with one of those readings at four o'clock in the morning, I'm shot. It kind of carries over to the next day. I'm emotional. I'm tired. Um, here, it, it's, it's like swinging by the frat house and saying hello and hanging out on the front porch. You know, it's light. It's airy. It's just an old man connecting with his son saying, I love you. And I do it all the time and, and it and enhances my life spiritually and every other way. Bye.
tasmae 